Quran. All right, looks like we are live, and I want to welcome everybody to Standing for Truth. On Standing for Truth, we focus on the truth of biblical creation. We also host debates, interviews, discussions, and more. And so if you enjoy the content being offered by this channel, please hit that subscribe button. Also, make sure to tell people about us. Now, today we have an awesome show for everybody. I'm extremely excited to introduce uh, Dr. Gordon Wilson to the program. It is a privilege to have uh, Gordon on with us again today. Gordon, thanks so much for being here. Thanks for having me, Donnie. It's great to be here again. My pleasure. My pleasure. This is going to be great. So I want to point out to the audience that this is actually um, Dr. Gordon Wilson's second time here on Standing for Truth. I have linked our first discussion in the description box for people to check out. Now, in our first discussion, we focus on abiogenesis. And today's topic of discussion, we will focus on many of Gordon's articles that he has written pertaining to God's cool creatures, including beetles, scorpions, lethal lizards, metamorphosis, and more. So this is going to be a lot of fun. And to the audience, please tag me at Standing for Truth with your questions for Dr. Wilson. Uh, Gordon, I want to hand it over to you, though, for uh, an introduction into who you are and why you find this topic so important. Well, I'm, uh, as Donnie has said, I'm Gordon Wilson, and I teach at New St. Andrews College in northern Idaho. And um, I teach a variety of biology classes, and it's wonderful to teach at a Christian classical Christ, well, Christian Christ-centered school, um, and be able to uh, give credit where credit is due. When I am uh, unveiling all of the complexity and diversity of life, uh, it's just wonderful to be able to give uh, God all of the credit for for what I'm teaching. In a secular school, you can't do that. It's verboten. Um, you know, that is heresy to them. So uh, I love um, talking about biology, whether it's in an academic setting in class or in this outlet I have with answers in Genesis of writing articles. You know, a lot of scientists like to write technical articles for peer-reviewed journals. And I think that's important, but um, my niche, my main niche uh, that I fell into is to just write popular uh, or mostly write popular articles uh, for answers. And again, as Donnie had mentioned, it's uh, writing articles that really showcase uh, various creatures, uh, usually animals, but sometimes plants, sometimes fungi. And um, without getting into too much technical detail, we have to have a biology degree to understand it, uh, just unveiling some of that so that the layperson can go, oh my goodness, this is incredible. And I see this all the time in my backyard. And I just kind of <laughs> look at it and go, oh, ho, hum. Um, so I'm, I'm wanting to give people in, whether it's in the class or in my answers articles or in the movie, uh, the the movies, the documentaries, the Riot in the Dance uh, series, um, a, a reason to celebrate the Creator uh, and to glorify God. Uh, often it's used for apologetic reasons, uh, which is great, uh, but sometimes it's great to just look at creation for what it is apart from saying, look at this cool thing and had to have been designed, or look at this cool thing, this just completely debunks evolution. That's got its place, but that's not all there is. We need to look at it and enjoy it and celebrate it 
because God is good. God is great. Amen. Amen. Oh, great introduction. Really yeah, great introduction, Gordon. And again, I want to say thanks so much for giving us your time for this important topic. I've linked these must read articles in the description box for everybody to check out for themselves. So that being said, uh, Gordon, we have so many great questions here. And what I'll do is just get right into the first one as time typically flies by. So the first yeah, question, sure does. <laughs> especially on these topics, I, you know, yeah. I, I could listen to you all day. So uh, this first question I have for you, uh, Dr. Wilson, is in an article on Answers in Genesis titled Beatles, Go Anywhere, Do Anything. You point out that the most diverse order of animals on the planet is by far the beetle order. Can you elaborate on these cool creatures for us? Yeah, um, so my master's degree was in entomology at the University of Idaho. And, and when I was taking insect identification, we were covering all the orders and about 200 families. And it was um, the thing that sort of, right, th there's over a million species of insects described. <laughs> And uh, almost half, I think my article said 300, over 350,000, but I think it's pushing, if not over 400,000 species, uh, ranging from less than a millimeter long adult beetle to eight, seven, eight inches long. So it's a, a huge and everything in between. Um, They've got a basic design that we, we all f are familiar with, which are these, um, they're sort of these flying little tanks. Uh, often they don't fly. Um, some are more apt to take to the air and others not. But they've got this tank-like design where the four wings are hardened into elytra. They're, that's the fancy word. Um, the non-fancy, non-technical word is um, wing covers. And those wing covers uh, cover over the back. And, uh, and then when they want to fly, they lift up and out come these membranous hind wings, which they can then, they, they, they're bigger, their surface area is bigger than the elytra, so they have a complex folding pattern uh, like you would see in a map, I mean, it's different than a map, but like if you fold out a map, I know now we just use Google Maps, but in the old days, we'd fold out this map. It's usually pleated and folded this way and that way, and it's got an or order to the folding pattern. Uh, beetle wings have a folding pattern that's intricate, and they fold up so they can fit underneath those wing covers. Um, so, that allows them to occupy all sorts of um, habitats. They can crawl into hard to get places uh, de depending on their size. And they can be all sorts of shapes and sizes and colors. Um, and I mean, the diversity is mind boggling. The, the shapes can be very wide and squatty to long and slender to very, very flat to, um, you know, everything. And they can be in just about every microhabitat you can imagine. Um, so there are some beetles that um, have really elongated forelegs that can swing through the branches of tropical trees like a monkey. Um, that was, I mean, you look at these legs and you go, what? because the elbows of the front legs extend way back uh, to the back legs. And, and then when they extend, they can reach up and grab a, a twig or something and they can sort of swing their way around, um, you know, a beetle acting like a monkey or uh, fireflies that uh, light up. Um, some people call them lightning bugs and some people call them fireflies, but they're neither bugs nor flies. They are beetles. And if you live in the eastern United States and you've seen, you know, a nice summer evenings on the edges of woodlands, the lightning bugs are lighting up, you catch one and you'll see that uh, they are beetles. They've got these elytra 
wing covers that form a um, a nice seam right down the middle between the wing covers that don't overlap. And that's how you can tell a beetle. Um, so the the ladybug, the the ladybugs are also not bugs, they're beetles. Uh, they've got nice, usually the most common species are orange or red, and they've got orange and red elytra with black polka dots on them. But you can see that nice straight seam running down the middle of the back between the two elytra, and that, again, uh, shows you that it's a beetle. So lightning um, dung beetles, um, uh, tiger beetles, tiger beetles are voracious predators. You think it can't be a, a beetle because beetles are sort of clumsy flyers, but uh, tiger beetles fly readily on uh, open uh, hillsides and where lots of dirt patches are. And they you think it's a fly and then they land and it's this nice um, colorful beetle. It's a... Uh, and I could go on and on uh, about beetles. You can read my article on it. Um, Whirly gig beetles are one of my favorites because they look like um, bumper cars that are on the water. So you often see water striders, which are what we are familiar with, with lanky legs that skitter across the ponds. In some places, you'll find whirly gig beetles, which look like little dark black or dark brown ovals that form aggregations on the surface of the water. It's either slow moving streams or um, ponds. And it looks like a high speed bumper car race on the surface of the water. And they're swirling around. That's why they're called whirly gigs, but they never crash into each other. Um, and they've got little paddle-like legs. The mid legs, they've got six legs. The mid legs and the hind legs are these little paddle-like uh, things that go really fast and then they cause the beetle to go zooming across the water, but gener generally not in a straight line, always in swirly patterns. Um, and then their front legs will grab prey if they find small insects on the surface of the water, they'll come up and grab the prey. Um, but whirly gigs aren't that big. They can be maybe that size to maybe that size. You know, I don't wanna say the full range because I haven't been to the tropics and often things are jumbo size in the tropics. But whirly gigs, one family of beetles. Um, and again, when I say family of beetles, that's not species. Uh, whirly gig beetles can have many species. Um, fireflies can have, or lightning beetles, lightning bugs can have many species. So the things that are mentioned, or I'm mentioning, are um, families. That's an awesome response, um, Gordon. Like I said, I, I could listen to these answers all day. And it immediately brings to mind Romans 120, where it talks about mm -hmm. how the, um, the invisible things of, of him from the creation of the world are, are clearly seen. And uh, right. it goes on to eventually say that they are without excuse because we see Amen. such amazing design where in just one specific creature like the beetle, as you're pointing out, we can just talk about it oh, essentially yeah. all day. Um, I do have some comments flying in. So I'll put this uh, question on the screen, Gordon. Uh, Landon Freeman, thank you so much. He says, beetles are interesting. They're incredibly diverse. So I wonder if there are at least a few beetle kinds. So I guess, what are your thoughts on how many kinds possibly there are when it comes to beetles? <laughs> you know, I said 450, 400 at least 1,000 th species. Right. Um, there's probably, I'm not sure of the exact number, but I think there's hundred and over 160 families. Yeah. And sometimes those families can have thousands of species. Uh, for example, the the weevils are Curculi, Curculionidae, and they're the most uh, numerous. Well, they're the fam, the biggest family with uh, over. Well, when I learned it, it was sixty thousand. I'm sure it's way over sixty thousand species of just weevils. 
Now, for me to say how many created kinds, I think there are more than a few. Um, when we talk about bear um, I'm a bit more conservative than my fellow creationists. Um, I've got some reasons. I don't want to get into the deep weeds. I love my creationist colleagues that have different opinions about how big created kinds can be. I, but I feel like the trend is a little crazy where um, it's sort of this, you've, you're familiar with the Russian doll analogy. Yes. Um, and I think this, this idea of created kinds, they're stuffing way too many, um, way too many Russian dolls into the big Russian doll, um, which, you know, after the flood, there's a diversification. I'm all for diversification, but when I've, when I took insect ID and there was incredible um, differences. And when we're starting to study, this is the sort of the quick answer without getting too deep. When we're studying created kinds, we can't just look at the similar similarities because that's what evolutionists do. They're always looking at, well, what do they share in common? Well, all life shares cells. They must all be related or they all share this DNA. They must be related. And I think if creationists get into that mindset too much, we start to lump things together that might not or should not be lumped. Uh, when you look at the diversity of beetles, uh, the differences between beetles are far different, far more different than say apes and chimps and people, okay? <laughs> um, we just look at, oh, seen one beetle, seen them all, no way. Some of the anatomical differences are mind blowing. And we can't just look at the similarities. We look at the, as I like to say, the devils and the differences. And we have to look at the genetic, bas uh, the genetic basis for those differences. You could say, well, maybe all of them have the same uh, or very similar genetics. Well, yeah, but let's look at where they, they're different. This requires a lot of high caliber research of looking at where the genomes are the same, but then when we look at the parts of the genome that are different, those are deal breakers. And this is my big warning to my fellow creationists who are uh, lumping and the created kinds I think are just getting really large. I'm not necessarily against those large, but I the large created kinds, but they need to prove to me that there's a, a genetic um, equivalence, a genomic equivalence across the genome before I'm willing to just say, oh yeah, they're the same created kind. Because when I'm looking at the differences in morphology, and I don't know the genetics of beetles, but I wanna see a enormous overlap. When we say that humans are all related and they're not related to chimps, the reason is, is because we have genes that chimps don't have. Now, if we use that same criteria with other animal groups, we need to be just as strict because we're, there's nothing, there's no vested interest in me going, uh, oh, you know, we can't, uh, when someone says I'm related to chimps, then, well, those are fighting words, you know, and creationists rally all sorts of evidence to say, here is, you know, and we go through our laundry list of all of the reasons, both anatomical and genetic, of why we're not related to the great apes. But then these same people will go, oh, and talk about these enormous created kinds that they shoehorn all sorts of disparate critters into this um, one kind. And I go, you know, when, <laughs> hold on, you know, where are the right. breaks? You need to use the same strict standard for deciphering created kinds as you do as you separate humans from apes. I, so, I completely sorry for getting off on that tangent, but, you know, I'd say, you know, even with one family of beetles, there's a huge div diversity. If you look at some of the weevils, one family, and there's some crazy differences, both behaviorally and anatomically. Right. That's actually a great point. I completely agree, uh, Gordon. We have to be consistent because I've even heard that oftentimes we have 
less differences between us as humans and the chimpanzees than some of your felid species, right? Maybe right. a lion and a tiger, or especially a lion and a house cat. But we as biblical creationists, we would say that for the most part, those felid species may belong to one kind. Yeah. The, and yet, the, they're, and right. yet they're more different than us and chimpanzees, right? Well, I don't know. I, I really don't know. Um, of, and that's why I'm not going to come down hard um, I haven't looked at the genetics. All I'm saying is, um, let's be consistent. Right. I'm not categorically against it, but I I, I do think that, um, you know, with the horse kind, if I'm just, you know, horse kind, um, bear kind, we ha we have to look at the genome. Um, because differential gene expression, you know, the genome is sort of important because you can have radically different body types with the exact same genetics. I'm, I mentioned this with frogs and tadpoles. It's the same individual. Right. right. But if you didn't know that tadpoles became frogs and you just looked at a tadpole, its anatomy, physiology and everything, and you go frog, these are utterly different creatures, and yet they're not just in the same species. They're the same individual. <laughs> it's right, just exactly. differential gene expression. So that's why I think we really need to look closely at the DNA and not be thrown off by morphology totally. I completely agree. I, I've always believed, and, and I frequently say that it's in our genetics where we can best answer this question of ancestry. I mean, it's genes, traits, and genetics that are inherited sperm and egg, right? Not a fossil, not a bone. And that's what that's my biggest problem. Oftentimes, the evolutionists, they'll build these phylogenetic trees based on fossils, Similar. where they're just looking yeah. at morphology and anatomy. But as you pointed out, Gordon, uh, morphology can oftentimes be deceiving, as we've right. got more variation within the same species oftentimes than, than across species. So. And they'll do their phylogenetic trees based on the extant species. They're looking at the genomes of all the extant species and doing a, a computer analysis and seeing who's more closely related by how similar the genomes are. And so um, they're not even you know, they're not even looking at the DNA uh, of the, they can't often look at the right, DNA of can. fossils. They just have to look at the DNA of what's living today and then build a tree from it. So uh, I'm no expert. Like I said, I'm writing mostly popular articles and there's a lot of creationists that are really doing um, uh, much more technical research. And I'm sort of a, a backseat driver. Um, <laughs> that's going careful right. you know, I know you're smarter than me but <laughs> I see your assumptions right, and exactly. your assumptions are not always going to be valid and a lot of creationists late creationists are just going to be um, eating up everything they say because well there are creationist leaders and if what they say is gospel truth and I think a lot of lay creationists need to realize that, you know, there's differences. I, I want to get along with all of them. I don't, uh, you know, they're my brothers and sisters in Christ. Uh, I'm not going to get into these, you know, uh, angsty, uh, antagonistic debates. It's going to be in love, but I'm, I'm saying you guys got to qualify your statements. We're sort Those of- great uh, points. Those it's are some a, great it was points. A great Gordon. question. I sort of went on a tangent. Work, but <laughs> it's 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 good. It's all good. Well, honestly, um, you know, this topic's so interesting that we probably could spend an hour per question. So yeah, that yeah, being said, what I'll do sure. is I'll jump right to the next question before before we we do that because <laughs> so many interesting points. So this next question, Gordon, is um, has to do with your article titled scorpions armed and dangerous and i've always been fascinated with with scorpions i think most people are so can you help us better understand these cool creatures and how exactly they fit in the biblical creation model well um 
again, we are looking at these creatures uh, in a post-fall world. So we don't know exactly what they look like. Um, I think in a pre-fall world, um, I think snakes and coat, like for example, lions look like lions um, before. Oh, that gets back to bear monology, sorry. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> so I, I think that a lot of creatures pre and post fall were recognizable, but uh, yeah, what's the, say the question again, I don't wanna go off on the tangent there. Um, oh, recognizing scorpions in their role today well, could you restate that, Donnie? Yes, definitely. So um, let me see here. Can you help us better understand these cool creatures? So I guess in general, maybe yeah. uh, kind of the same way you did with, with beetles. Yeah. And then how exactly they may fit in, in the biblical creation model, maybe pertaining to their design. Well, you know, they were created on day six. And like it says, it, it's not being specific other than all the creeping things. Uh, creatures that were made and the creeping creatures will uh, include a vast <laughs> number of <laughs> of species, probably all insects, um, definitely scorpions because they can't even fly. So, um, and we know from Genesis 1, 29, 1, uh, Genesis 1, 30, that all creatures were herbivores. And we have to take that on faith. Um, so we see some things that are obviously exclusively predatory, and they seem to be armed for that lifestyle, that ecological niche. Um, with the scorpion, you've got these big old uh, pincher-like appendages called petty palps uh, sticking out front. Uh, right on the front of the uh, the head of the scorpion, you've got these, um, the first appendages are called the chelicery. And the chelicery ha are topped off with fangs, uh, but the petty palps, which are big and long and pinchy, they will grab the prey and often tear it up, uh, dismember it, and then hand it off to the chelicery to eat it. Now, obviously, they didn't do that kind of thing prior to the fall. They were herbivores. So they they were either, there was a different set of genes and maybe they looked different. Maybe they actually looked very similar, but then used a lot of their anatomical, um, the petty palps and chelicery uh, to, to use it to macerate uh, plant material and still were liquid feeders we we don't we just don't know and it's it's we have to be careful just like evolutionists will often reconstruct the past that was not observed creationists can do the same thing and if enough creationists say that it becomes sort of indelibly printed in people's minds and it becomes gospel and i i really want to avoid um wild speculation and have it become canonized uh, among <laughs> creationists. Um, so I, you know, but speculation, you know, take it with a grain of salt, but we do know they were plant eaters. They may have looked different uh, based on differential gene expression, or they had the same stuff and ripped up plants and um, ate in a similar way. That's a great answer. Um Gordon, I, I appreciate the, that. The stinger, you might think, well, what's the stinger doing? Right. They do use the stinger in courtship, as I said in my article, um, as they're doing the promenade with their, when they're uh, courting the female, the, um, the, the male may uh, sting um, the female in the pedipalp or in the thorax, I'm sorry, cephalothorax, um, and it seems to pacify her. Um, pacify her, not pacifier. Um, <laughs> and, um, you know, I think that's a good plan if you're courting a killer. Um, 
but I don't know if they use the sting or even if the sting and the venom glands were even expressed before the fall. Um, you, you know, when you look at these uh, morphological arsenals uh, on uh, so many creatures uh, have um, uh, morphological arsenals that sort of boggle the mind and they may have been sporting them, may have actually had them and used them for other purposes, or they didn't have them, but they were definitely encoded in the genome. Um, so that when the fall happened, um, there was a, uh, a flip of the switch, some kind of flip, uh, and certain genes were turned off, certain genes were turned on, and it meta sort of metamorphosed uh, into um, this now predator. Um, yeah, someone I just saw pop up about the herbivorous spider, and um, that is, that's a very, that's something that I bring up in my, um, one of my articles, um, trying to remember, because I bring up spiders in a couple things. I talked about the um, bola spider, but in one of my articles, I talked about the um, herbivorous spider, which they discovered not too long ago on the, um, on the acacia trees in South Central America, where uh, it's sort of the classic example of uh, mutualism between the ants um, that uh, it's on the bullhorn, bullthorn acacia or bullhorn acacia where the ants defend, the, the acacia leaves are very edible and the ant colony lives and patrols the whole plant and attacks uh, any herbivore that lands on it. And there's a, a veg, oh, that's right. I did write a vegetarian. It was just, um, I did an article on that veggie spider. Um, the, there's one spider that skulks around on those branches, avoiding attack uh, by the ants that are defending the tree. And the, the spider um, snitches um, the belchin bodies and other, th uh, I think that's their primary target to feed on some of the plant material of, of this acacia tree. And that was new because they thought that spiders all you know, um, I think there's about 40,000 species of spider. Right. And that was the first time they found an herbivorous uh, spider. Uh, so if a spider can be an herbivore, then so can a scorpion. Maybe they're not any alive today, but we know it's possible. Now, this just came to mind. This isn't a question that I have, but it, it's these... Uh, thousands of species that, that we often hear and, and that we're talking about here. Now, I find, and I'm curious as, as to your opinion, since we have oftentimes such drastic differences in, in morphology, but yet very similar genetics, right, the genotype itself, then is that, would you say that's a, a really large overestimate? Because it seems like these people that are naming new species are looking at any little variation that's slightly different in morphology and now giving it a new name. So it makes it us... Might be. I think they're, that. That's a good point. Um, I don't know what all goes into um, discovering new species. They'll often see uh, a new body type and they will cross check it, you know, um, I think also genetically making sure that it's not lining with other uh, species. They will um, also um, look at whether it can um, even breed with the closest thing that they can come up with in the same genus. And uh, if it, you know, so yeah, they often species today are are pretty pretty much in a genetic box canyon. They've they've diversified to where there there's not a whole lot of variation. You know, you look at field guides from 
the 1920s uh, at the same species of bird as today and you just don't have a whole lot of just, yeah you can use those field guides today right. things just sort of they're like they've got that that phenotype pegged and it sort of matches the um but then there's other things that show a whole lot more variation so we have to be careful um and i don't know when they get a new species what are all the things they're looking at um but i i hope they would look at the genes to see like for example on the cicadas you have uh Right now, back east, you have this 17-year cicada uh, uh, coming up in crazy numbers. I don't know. Are, are they in your neighborhood, Donnie? Um, actually, what, which one is that? The the the, the periodic cicada. I don't think so. All the racket. Um, there are some cicadas that are different species but you can't tell them apart morphologically. They have a different call. Yeah, the, no, that's... Yeah, and so sometimes it's their call, and so that's this thing that separates species because they don't mate with each other because, well, they've got a different mating call. Right. Um, or they have genitals that um, are incompatible you know, some insects sort of a lock and key thing that they just don't fit. Um, even though to a normal person looking at these two bugs, they'll go, what's the difference? Right. But we're, we're, we're not used to looking at differences in, you know, insects. We see, we, we're used to facial differences in our own kind but when we look at things that are radically even more different from each other than we are from each other, we can't tell them apart. That's a, that's a good <laughs> point. That's a you need experts to go, oh man, they're miles apart. Like I'm, I'm into reptiles as well as insects, but reptiles, I was like, these two snakes are as different as you can possibly get. <laughs> and other people go, it's a snake. Yeah, <laughs> it's a snake. It's the same thing. It's a snake, you know. <laughs> um, it doesn't have any legs. What are you seeing that I'm not right. seeing? I'm like, well, golly, don't you see the body shape is totally different? The colors are different. The scales are different. Everything's different. Good grief. <laughs> <laughs> Those are some great points. Very interesting points, uh, Gordon. And it, it brings me to this this next question because it's an article I really enjoyed that you wrote once again on Answers in Genesis titled uh, Lethal Lizards. And you ask a very important question. You write, the existence of venom in so many animals has long challenged creationists. Mm -hmm. How did it show up in a very good creation? So I, I know personally that the existence of venom uh, Gordon has been a challenge I've I've seen from proponents of, of evolution. Can you help us answer this important question? Well, that's a, a question that I've sort of alluded to it already, but um, this is just my version. I'm not speaking for all creationists, but I think it's it's a reasonable answer. Uh, God created everything, and it said in Genesis one thirty one, it was very good. And then when you look at the animal kingdom, you see all these crazy uh, anatomical, whether it's venom, um, like in, um, well, and I was talking about lethal lizards, uh, venom glands in lizards, but also uh, snakes. You have these elaborate and highly sophisticated venom with all sorts of things that attack uh, animal tissue. Um, so you've got phospholipases and phosphatases and L amino oxidase and uh, lipases and proteases. Uh, these are the hemo, um, hemolytic or hemotoxic venoms uh, like in rattlesnakes and other um, vipers. And the venom delivery is highly sophisticated where you've got the venom glands and you've got compressor muscles that squeeze the glands. You've got hinged fangs that rotate like a seesaw and you it's just mechanically complex you've got a hollow fang and you've got soft 
tissue duct going up to a hollow fang. So it's a hypodermic needle, basically a curved hypodermic needle that folds up and lies on the roof of the mouth. And they can be extra long because they fold. And so they swing out, stab into the uh, prey. You go, uh, uh, doesn't compute. How do I work that into a good creation? And going back to what I'd said earlier about herbivore spiders being predators now, most of them, but then um, everything was an herbivore. So the same goes for spiders, the same goes for snakes, the same goes for anything that is a predator. But I, I like to look at snakes and, well, in this article, lizards, because um, you're going, how does that work into a who, good God? And basically, the way I reconciled it in my head, uh, this goes back to the whole question of theod the, the theodicy question of, you know, why the problem of evil. And this question is the problem of natural evil. And like I said before, um, in Romans 8, it says all, all creation groans. It was subject to futility. Um, what I think happened at the fall was that uh, I don't think that Satan made these things. They're way too complex. I'm not going to give him credit for some of the most uh, sophisticated creations out there. Um, but I do know that these are um, a curse. And who is, um, who is the author of judgment? Amen. The author, you know, God is the one, the wages of sin is death. And so when man sinned, he didn't just die spiritually. He, he was now mortal and all creation fell with him, which meant that I think this is my take on it, is that all of these creatures that were going to become venomous, whether toxic or venomous, um, all the I'm I'm broadening the picture here beyond lethal lizards. Right. Uh, all creatures that are predators or parasites had before the fall the um, all of the genetic information that would be expressed at the fall. So they then morph, morphed, they metamorphosed into their post-fall state, their post-fall status, which was you're now a parasite, you're now a predator, you're now a pathogen. And I think there, there has been some um, naturalistic explanation. Some of it is mutation, uh, degradation, degradation, genomic uh, entropy that's caused things to go uh, sort of off the rails. But on some cases, I don't think it's just degeneracy. I think it's highly sophisticated, right. not de degenerate. <laughs> and I think it was designed that way in the genome. And then when the fall happened, these, uh, these morphological things were then expressed. So venom glands, uh, you know, venom ducts, um, hollow fangs, um, like in the lethal lizards that I talked about, the Gila monster and the be Mexican beaded lizard, they have these grooved, it's not as sophisticated, say, as a viper or, a, or an elapid snake, but they've got these um, uh, salivary glands that have the venom in their lower jaw. And then when they grab a hold and bite, they just hang on and chew. <laughs> and the venom just kind of goes up those little grooves and wicks into the wound um, and causes um, great pain and uh, death. But like on the on the on the Gila monster, as I mentioned in the article, it's um, it doesn't look like it's used for predatory reasons because they really go after helpless things like little nestlings or um, you know, baby birds, baby mice, eggs, you know, um, things that really they don't need to use their, their venom. The venom seems to be more of a defensive, um, right. weapon. 
and their their coloration is bright so it makes sense that you know um don't mess with me i'm right. <laughs> i'm dangerous but that's my sort of short answer it's it was god it said it was very good but then when i ask my question how did a good god make all of these nasty things it's like well is justice good right yes um when when god says that these are the consequences of sin these are the the curses that i've built into the fabric of creation and your your rebellion against me and adam has unleashed all of these things that is my explanation i think it was woven into the fabric of the creatures beforehand and then they were not expressed they were totally benign before the fall um the ecology i don't even think we can wrap our head around it the ecology was completely benign and but and and it's my guess as good as yours on what it would be like but we can't we can't comprehend heaven either right and heaven is going to not just be ethereal and we're bouncing around on clouds and we're ghosty <laughs> bodies it's going to be very very corporeal meaning we will have bodies amen and amen. the animals i assume there will be animals in heaven and it's going to be glorious and there's not going to be any antagonistic relationships there um i think we get a glimpse of that in isaiah 11. um that's a wonderful passage um the lion shall lie down with the lamb the co um the child shall play by the cobra's den uh you know the just read the passage i'm sorry i don't have it committed to memory i, no. I never was in a one that's okay no the, and that's um, a great passage you brought up so many good points there, Gordon, and I completely agree. And I think there is actually before I say this, I want to point out I, I looked up the cicadas you were talking about, and I was I was shocked to see oh these are the um, creepy bugs that are making all that noise. So that's that's yeah. interesting. Yeah, I never <laughs> put two and two together there. Um, so what I was going to say pertaining to what you said there, which you said so many good points, is that I think we have uh, supporting evidence for what you're talking about, Gordon, in terms of the epigenome and how we have these genetic switches that mm -hmm. are just waiting to be turned on or this, this genetic information that's hidden in compressed form waiting to be revealed right. through environmental changes. And I've got, yeah. a, I've got a multitude of papers, Gordon, that, that I've read through that go over rapid adaptation rapid evolution that even the evolutionists are, yeah. are kind of shocked right they're they think shocked because they're expecting it to just be sort of this um random mutation and random mutation doesn't generate sophisticated anything it's usually a degradation and so when all of these new um a new feature pops out that you know they sort of know it's designed it didn't just kind of it's mutations do things like tumors <laughs> things that are um right there's just no design to them or it's a broken thing it, it it looks like okay this was designed but now it's not working very well but when you see new new things pop into existence you go that didn't just pop out de novo that was hidden away in the genome all along and um, I like to think of created kinds, um, this is just a loose analogy, like a, a um, think of, think of a, a Swiss army knife. And God made before the fall, the Swiss army knife that was just benign, you know, nothing, nothing there looked like a perfectly innocent oval shaped thing. And then the fall happened and blades came out, <laughs> right. uh, scissors, screwdrivers, uh, mm -hmm. you know, all these things were sort of embedded in there. They were not, they didn't, random events didn't produce these things. It was all designed in, in, in it, hidden form. It's like a multifunctional tool. Multifunctional tool. And some of those tools 
are for living in a fallen world. And I think uh, when we get into a new heavens and a new earth, um, all of those arsenals are going to be packed away again. Well, and, and I think that really helps answer the question, uh, a, a question that I have, and it's a common criticism, is how do we get all of these species in just a few thousand years from, from the ark? And right. yet what you're saying is perfect, because if we have all this genetic information compressed yeah. in hidden form waiting to be revealed, well, then even in one generation, we can have adaptive episodes, we can have rapid change. And as you pointed out, the evolutionists, Gordon, look to mutations as the source for all genetic variation, but mutations lead to disease, cancer. One point mutation can kill somebody. Yeah. Um, it can be loss of, it can be um, often gain of function is actually loss of information. If, right. if you look at some of Behe's work, uh, and actually Behe's new book called Darwin Devolves, a lot of things can be um, actually selectively advantageous when there's a mutation that actually knocks out a certain um, gene. Um, it's a loss of information, but it's a gain of function, um, or it makes it more lethal. Um, just, I worked when I was in molecular biology a long time ago, I worked in doc, uh, Dr. Scott Minnick's lab. You may have seen him on intelligent design videos. And I was his lab tech for a, two and a half years. And um, we were working on a a pathogen called Yersinia, which is the genus that includes the bubonic plague and one uh, and a few others. But uh, it turns out that the reason the bubonic plague pathogen is so path pathogenic, um, it makes COVID look like a Sunday school picnic, is that um, it lost its ability to make flagella um, the, the, it still has flagellin genes, so it can still make bacterial, I mean, it can, it still has the genes for flagella, but it doesn't make them at all. Uh, and that enables Yersinia pestis to fly under the radar, because when you've got flagella dangling out of your bacterial cell, it's a great antigen for your immune uh, system to detect and then mount antibodies against that antigen. But when you don't have flagella, you can actually, um, that's one of the reasons they can evade the immune system uh, often until it's too late and you don't survive. So a lot of mutations are beneficial to the person, not to the person, but to the, the uh, critter that's got the mutation. That's a great point. And, and I always appreciate, Gordon, how thorough and informative your, your answers are, where it's, it, it's, it's so much of the information found in your article put in, into, into words. And I, and I re really appreciate, appreciate that because these questions are so important. And I will say this, we're coming at the, at the hour mark. So yeah. I'll start winding it down with, with this yeah. last question, Gordon, because I do have this in the title. So I definitely want to get this one in there because this has to do with a very cool article you you wrote titled Metamorphosis, A Symphony of Miracles. Mm -hmm. So as, as a final question, can you tell us a little, a little bit about metamorphosis and whether or not metamorphosis is better explained by creation or- Oh my evolution? goodness. Well, if anything is better explained by creation, it's metamorphosis. Um, every, the, even the simplest cell is just, um, crazy design. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we think, well, we'll find this creature that's going to be so over the top complex that no evolutionist could, could deny it. But the problem is it's a heart issue. We sometimes think, well, well this will get them. This will back them into the corner and they're going to have to land on their knees and say, what, what must I do to be saved? <laughs> but no, they don't. It doesn't matter how complex. Metamorphosis is, is um, intelligent design on steroids. Um, <laughs> yeah. 
It, um, I like to, my dad once said, intelligent design, the understatement of the century. <laughs> it, it's, it's true. Um, mm -hmm. I, I can't, I just would recommend you read the article. Um, basically, when you've got this caterpillar, it looks nothing like the butterfly. Um, and then when it molts into a bigger caterpillar and a bigger caterpillar, all of it is just highly regulated. Um, the hormones are flipping switches. Um, there's a, a, a symphony of hormones that are turning off certain genes, turning on others, so that eventually, once it gets to be a big enough caterpillar, uh, it molts. But instead of molting into a bigger caterpillar, it molts into a pupa. It makes a different exoskeleton. And then it basically, I compare it to gutting a house down to the studs. Uh, so much of the former body uh, internally is just liquefied. Uh, it's programmed cell death. A lot of, um, a lot of tissues are dissolved or, or digested. Other tissues are spared and set aside, but then there's a revamping of of that. Um, there's a little video uh, on the uh, video link at the end of my metamorphosis article that's, um, oh, Alestra Media, I think, did it. It's a little clip about metamorphosis. And I would recommend that you watch that plus read the article. But it just goes through um, how so much of that um, caterpillar body is liquefied and then a new cuticle is laid down, a new exoskeleton is laid down, which is the pupa. And certain cell, little uh, cells are set aside, which grow into these imaginal discs. And these are little patches of cells that are attached right under the epidermis. And they are responsible for creating a lot of the adult uh, body form um, whether it's wings or legs or antennae or proboscis. But when you look at the caterpillar, it's just, there's not really much correspondence. <laughs> it, it's like a totally new, almost a totally new body. Right. In order to do that, just like with a marching band, um, back in the old days before they just had skanky people running around on the football field during halftime, they would have, actually musicians marching according to a certain plan. And each, each one practiced their marching trajectory and they knew where in the score to turn left or turn right. Um, and each, each instrument was playing its own tune, but they all were going to a certain big overarching plan. Uh, and the, then all of these people, sometimes if you've seen marching bands, they will, they will be marching in all these nice tidy ranks. And then all of a sudden they'll scatter and it looks like it's just chaos. And all of these band members are running around the field, but then they all of a sudden line up in another array and you, from the cheap seats, you can look down and it spells some word uh, on the field. This doesn't happen by chance. Every, everybody's got a different, literally, marching order. Right. And cells in the body of, uh, in, the, in a caterpillar, as they're metamorphosing into uh, a pupa and then the adult, uh, it's kind of like that, but just way, way, way more complicated than that. Um, when you gut a house, you take all of the debris and send it to the dump. But when a caterpillar does it and t tears everything down inside, it uses a lot of those nutrients rather than taking it to the dump, it recycles all of those nutrients and builds the new body from the liquefied contents of the old. So there you go. Um, <laughs> that was fantastic. I'm just kind of scraping the surface, but it's just, uh, fantastically complex. The problem yeah. is we need to have, you, when you have a lot of smart people that are completely, completely committed to Darwinism for the last 160 years, 
and they're they're all the experts so it's easy for and then you look at this little tiny band of gideon's troops uh called creationists we're a bunch of whack jobs um and then you've got all these institutions all this money and all these museums and it's like these guys know all this stuff but they're so so utterly wrong and what we need to do is just in, um, we need to raise our children up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord, teach them to love God's creation, teach them not to just go, gee whiz, but to study hard. They need to, they need to replace these guys. They need to do well in school, graduate, go to grad school, and get into these positions. And we need to just yeast and loaf, man, yeast in the loaf. <laughs> We need to take over um, or either build our own institutions and raise up great, great men of faith, uh, great women of faith, and just uh, take over the sciences because it's all crumbling down with all of this craziness now. Amen. That you can't even, it's so politicized. It's, uh, it's so politicized, I can't even trust science anymore. I don't right. know. Is this real data or is this got some spin on it? So um, we need to get back to, I like your title, Standing for Truth. We need to, we not, we can't just have a bunch of creationists waving their flag going, yay, Ken Ham, yay, Dr. <laughs> Wilson, yay, whoever. Right. You know, we need to build an army of good thinking scientists that just outcompete these guys. Amen. Well said. I, I, glory to God. All the glory to God. I, I couldn't agree more. We need to raise up a generation of creationist warriors. Warriors um, and good, well-equipped and well-trained scientists that don't just say, oh, it must be true. A creationist said it. And, and that's why I believe these, these programs are so important. And that's why I just want to thank you again for you know, giving me your time for this important show, because this is just another amazing opportunity to showcase the glory of God and to showcase the amazing design of, of the God that we serve. We've had a great chat, tons of great feedback and questions. If we got through every question, Gordon, we'd probably be here till tomorrow. So yeah. what we're going to do is, is we're going to end it on that question. I do want to say one thing, because your answer was, was so fascinating. And I want everybody to please check the description box of this video and, and uh, go through these articles themselves but if you want to see a, a just so story uh gordon just ask the evolutionist how metamorphosis evolved you'll see unfortunately what a wild imagination that they have instead of just kind of tapping out and and admitting that uh this is amazing design and as you said earlier you know what must we do to be saved because we see it in in his creation mm -hmm. so uh, that being said, I want to thank you again. Are there any final words or anything, uh, Dr. Wilson, before we shut it down for the night? No, I, I think I've, uh, I, that, that's my big exhortation. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say that those right there are the perfect concluding words. So again, it, it's been an hour and five minutes and I can't really believe it because time has flown by. Uh, some great answers to some important questions. So Gordon, Thanks again for joining us. I really You're appreciate welcome. you giving us your time. Thank, thank you for having me. Be happy pleasure. to do it again sometime. Awesome. I appreciate that. God bless you. Right. And God, God bless, bless the, the audience. All right.